you want to turn your Bible, you can do that this morning to Exodus chapter 12. You know, I just really love what the Lord's doing in the preparation of our hearts. You know, one of the things that I learned at a young age that, that I can't say that I've always followed is that preparation is really nine-tenths of what creates success in your life. Because the more you prepare, the more you position yourself for opportunity. Now, we know that holds true in the natural world, obviously, but it's also spiritually because there's something about the heart that keeps setting itself for the Lord, that we continually come once again before the Lord no matter how long you've been walking with God, it's irrelevant, really, because what matters is what happens to you today. You know, the Scripture says that he, today is the day of our salvation, Jehovah, right now, God. And it's easy to put things to the future or very easy to put things to the past, but the Lord wants it to be today that there's a decision made in our heart that today there's something set right in us, that we don't rely upon the, the victories or the failures of the past or even the promise of tomorrow, but we say, Lord, I'm settling this issue right now because I, I want to prepare myself for everything that you want to do in my life, not only me, but us, because this is the day that the Lord has made. Now, the book of Exodus, and I know it's a little early to go into Passover because Passover is not till next month, but you never know. It's never too early, right? And we, we understand as we look at Passover, the significance of Passover, I think all of us are very well aware of that and the power of what it means to us. But I just want to bring some points this morning that may propel us a little quicker than having to wait a month. How many would rather have it today than next month? Because you might not be here next month. So we want what God wants to do for us right now. And I sense in my spirit that, that most of us feel, and I can't say that I haven't felt this way before, because that's the way I've lived for 47 years in the Lord. I'm always living with a sense of expectation. I'm always living with a sense of fulfillment of promise. How about you? I, and I would, I would hate to be the person that doesn't live that way. I wouldn't want to live in a place of dread and trepidation where I think that everything is fail, failing and everything is bad. But I want, to, I want to live in a place where there's a level of expectancy in my heart that's literally creating something in me to position me for what God wants to do through me and in me. And as we come to a time of once again the Passover, remembering in the old covenant, but we all always know, of course, that Christ is our Passover lamb. So it's not a feast that we observe once a year. It's something that we do on a daily basis. It's something that we remind ourselves continually before the Lord to continually let the spirit of Passover rule and reign in our hearts. Turn me down just a little bit, guys. And so, in the book of Exodus chapter 12, we see that if you want to read there, I'm not going to read the, the whole scripture because there's like 40 verses, but I'm just going to touch on it just a little bit. In verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be the beginning of months. Everybody say the beginning. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So, everything begins somewhere, right? There's a beginning and there's an ending. But until you begin something, you have no vision of what the ending will be. So the Lord said, is declaring to us that to mark a day in our life, that this is the day it all begins with us. And that's the way I want to look at today in the Lord. I want this service to be something fresh birthed in me that says, today I'm changing. Today, something supernatural is going to visit me 
and transform my life. Amen? So when we come to the table of the Lord, we remember what he told them in Egypt, that they were to take two things. They were to take the lamb, and they were to take the blood of the lamb. And in doing that, they were preparing themselves for deliverance. And it goes on to, in verse 11, and thus you'll eat it. Now, when he said, you're going to take this, this lamb, and you're going to eat it. And you're going to take this blood, and you're going to put the blood on the doorpost. Because when this the death angel comes, if the blood of the lamb is over your doorpost, the death angel is going to pass you by. And the first the firstborn of anyone that didn't have the blood over the door would die. So the judgment began that night. But then he says, you're going to eat the lamb, and you're going to do it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you will eat it in haste, for it's the Lord's Passover. So let's look at these three things. A belt on our waist, sandals on our feet, and a staff in our hand. He's telling them that things are gonna happen so quickly, the minute you, you eat the lamp, that you better be ready to move right now. You better have, you better have your, your, your belt on, you better have your sandals on, and you better have your staff in your hand because I'm fixing to do something new in your life. And the thing that all of us understand that when Christ comes, when Christ becomes real to us, something happens to us at that very moment that we know that we're propelled in a moment of a twinkling of an eye, out of a place of darkness, into a place of light. We become, behold, all things pass away, and we become a brand new creature in the Lord. The moment Jesus becomes real to you. Amen? That's why when we come to the service, if we come with the expectancy that the Lord's going to reveal himself to me today, we're going to come prepared to move and take action on what's revealed to us. Every time there's a revelation, it doesn't come just to tickle our ears and to make us say, wow, what the revelation that is. The revelation comes to reveal who he is. See, every revelation that comes through the word of God has one purpose to reveal him in the midst of us. And when he's lifted up, in the midst of us, and we see him at that very moment, we're transformed and changed, and we better be ready to change. We better be ready to move. One of the great tragedies in doing church is doing church to the point of passivity and complacency, doing church without a spirit of expectancy. Because the spirit of the age is to get us to fall back and just begin to accept the place that we're at. And the Lord said, the place you're at is not where I want to leave you. Amen? Yeah. Well, we've been living here in Egypt for 400 years. And we've kind of put down our roots. See, would, you, wouldn't you think that if you've been a people living in another country for 400 years, that somehow they would so dominate you that you would become part of them? That's the natural thinking, isn't it? I mean, just think about it. None of us have relatives, probably, that have lived in the United States more than 400 years. How in the world, all of a sudden, here we are in the United States, and all of a sudden, here comes this man and tells us that I'm going to set you free, and I'm going to take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. What do we say? Wait a minute. We've got roots down here. We've built, we've built foundations. We've put pegs down. We've put tents up. We've raised our children. We've buried our fathers and our mothers. This place is our home. And he says, wait a minute. I'm going to deliver you from that place. And I'm going to bring you into a place that's flowing with milk and honey. We say, we have it. 
Yeah, but, yeah, but this isn't Egypt. This isn't like Egypt, is it? Exactly like it. Because as great as our world seems, as great as our nation is, and we all applaud that, in comparison to the life and the glory of God, it's bondage. Amen? As great as the tradition of our fathers may have been, even in the organization of the church in our Western civilization, it's still not the pinnacle of what God wants us to have. There's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. So get ready. For when the Lord comes suddenly, when the Lord shows up in the midst of us, and you see what happens in Malachi, he'll come like a refiner's fire, like a fuller soap, and he'll purify the sons of Levi. Because let me tell you, as great as you may perceive this existence you have now, or maybe you don't perceive your existence so great, maybe you have a revelation that you're like that slave in Egypt, as great as that may seem to you, it pales in comparison to the kingdom of God that wants to be birthed upon the earth. Amen? So get ready. Get, put your belt on. Put your shoes on. Put the staff in your hand because we're ready, getting ready to move. See, preparation is for one thing and one thing only, change. You prepare not simply to give yourself a gold medal because you prepared. Preparation is for only one reason, to bring change to your life. Amen? And the more you prepare, the more you position, the more you come, to the Lord, like he said in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, if you'll come through the door, he'll sup with you and he with you. Amen? So once we partake of the lamb and the blood, get ready for the breakthrough. Amen? Get ready. Everything changes. Because... The greater the revelation that he is. I'm going to tell you, the Lord can come to you in such revelation, in such power, in such glory, that it transforms your life, life to the point that you'll never be the same. Yeah, well, pray, well, thank you, Pastor, for reminding me that 35 years ago, yes, that's what happened to me. Well, what's happened to you today? Amen? We can't live on what happened to us yesterday. We have to live on what we receive today. The greatest danger that we face as a people is being conformed to the image of this land that we live in. When we know that it's not the land that God intends for us to dwell. There's a land flowing with milk and honey. And the whole purpose of Passover is to get ready for the new thing that God has for us. See, Passover literally means the inauguration of action. Did you know that faith doesn't stand by itself and broadcast itself as a standalone quantity of God? Faith without action, faith without works, is dead. Amen? You know, a man can't say, have, hey, say, I have faith, but I have no works. Right? You can't say, I have works, but no faith. Because faith comes through the knowledge of him. Because he is faith. Faith is not a separate commodity that comes down that we, we buy. Faith is the very package of Christ in the midst of us. I don't seek faith for faith's sake. I don't even seek love for love's sake. I seek him. And if I be found in him, then faith is found in me. If I be found in him, then love is found in me. I don't have the power to forgive you 
on the merit of my ability to forgive because I don't have that ability with my natural self. My natural man judges you. But when I'm in Christ, then I see you through his eyes. Amen? So the inauguration of action literally means everything begins to get in motion. It changes us from a nation of slaves into a nation of free people. A na can a nation, it says, be born in a day? Well, on that one day, it said that when they prepared themselves and they took the lamb, you see, they had, to, they had to have the initiative. There's two things they had to do. They had to have the initiative to go find the lamb. They had to have the initiative to slay the lamb. They had to have the initiative to eat the lamb. They had to have the initiative to put the blood over the doorpost. Without those initiatives taking place within them, I dare say not one of them would have been set free from Egypt. You say, well, I'm just showing up so freedom is mine. No, freedom is not yours until you seize it, until you prepare for it, until you cry out for it, until you say, yes, Lord. See, that's why the Scripture tells the New Testament, if you really love God, you will obey every word that he says. See, it's in your obedience that you position yourself for the breakthrough that God wants you to have. It's not good enough to come and say, boy, I think the pastor's being obedient. Or I think sister so-and-so is, boy, she's quite a Christian. She's obedient. No, the Lord said, look at your own heart. Because I want to set you free. I don't want to have a few leaders free. I don't want to have just a few people free, but I want this to be a nation that's free. I want every man, every woman, every child, every oxen, <laughs> every hoof, hoof thing that has hoofs, I want all of them to come out of bondage. Amen. Chewbacca. Is that someone said Chewbacca? Who was that? The Church of the Holy Chewbacca. <laughs> Woo. Lord. See, we're moving. And there, there's some things I want to bring quickly this morning. Because I have a long ways to go, but a short time to get there. When, when, when we move into Passover, when we move into partaking of the Lord... Judgment comes upon everything that's standing in your way. How many know if the Lord is on your side? Huh, who can bring a charge against the Lord's elect? What weapon can be formed against you? No weapon formed against you will prosper when you eat the lamb. See, every hindrance, how in the, what can we get out of this place? We've been here 400 years. We don't have any money. We don't have any transportation. Grandma's sick. Papa's grappin'. He's sick. Children, we got runny noses. We have no sandals on our feet and you're saying we're going to come out of this place and we're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey give me a break how eat the lamb for the moment they ate the lamb God's promise became real and all of a sudden the chains broke hallelujah all of a sudden the judgments against Egypt came. I'm going to tell you, brethren, when you follow him, there's nothing will stand in your way. You may seem to be an impregnable position you're in where you have no hope. You have no way. There's no pathway. But when you grab a hold of the Lamb of God, every door opens. Every obstacle is brought low. Every mountain is brought down. Every valley is filled because the Lord is on your side. 
Amen. Who can stand to bring a charge against God's elect? Yeah, mama, how are we going to get out of this little shack that we've been, our, us and our, and our forefathers have been inhabiting for 400 years? How are we going to get out of this place? Bring a lamb in the house. Mm. Get ready for freedom. Not only, the, the judgment came against the oppressors, but not only that, but God so reversed the curse that he caused the curse to turn around and become the blessing. Mm. They, when they left Egypt, they left with everything they needed to make the journey. There was not one need that wasn't met. See, the more we come into the Lamb of God, we move into a level of immunity that we've never known before. It's the changing of an age. When an age changes, what happens? The old age has to die. Another is being born. Behold. I like that. Behold. Shall it not spring forth to birth? Shall I not do a new thing upon the earth? Behold, a new thing is coming when we embrace the Lamb. Wow, brand new, shiny, right off the factory, right out of the factory, right out of the showroom. Brand new thing. It even has a new car smell. Hallelujah. Woo. Because one age is dying, another is being born at the same time. We, they, moved, they moved into a place where their shoes didn't wear out. They no longer had any needs. They had manna in the morning. They had water from the rock. They had a fire by night and a cloud by day. They went from a people of total despair total hopelessness, total frustration, total poverty to a people that have every need met because they ate the lamb. Wow. You say, boy, pastor, I've got trouble. Trouble here in River City. Eat the lamb. I got bills I can't pay. Eat the lamb. I got sicknesses that are overwhelming me. Eat the lamb. I'm in despair and discouragement, disillusionment. Eat the lamb. God's ready to take you out into a place of immunity where he becomes our provision. Amen. I am Jehovah. What's Jehovah? What's the, I'm Je, El Jehovah El Shaddai. I'm the great breasted one. Woo! Man, pull up a chair. <laughs> Partake of the Lord. Amen. Woo! All your needs will be supplied to you according to his riches and glory. Mm. So you wake up the next morning, you don't have to say, hey, Johnny, I'm sorry I don't have any food today, but I'll try to, I'll try to boil some rocks a little bit later and throw a few turnips in with it and give you some soup. No, Johnny, that morning, he just goes out and starts eating. It's already there. It's already provided. Amen? See, in the, in, the, in the Passover, there's this awesome principle of transference that takes place. How many know what transference is? Transference can work all different directions. It flows to you, and it can flow through you. See, through the lamb and through the blood, they were able to transfer this bondage to him. When they ate the lamb, they said, okay, 400 years of slavery, 400 years of misery, 400 years of being disrespected as a people, 400 years 
of being beat down, 400 years of guilt and shame. It's yours. Wow. Hallelujah. I'm no longer a slave. Now I'm free. Because all that I was, I gave him. 1970 in my backyard of my home in Amarillo, I stood there on a windy, blustery night with a beer can in my hand. And my heart found a lamb. And I took that beer can, and I'm not saying drinking beer is evil. I'll tell you two places I can't drink beer. I can't drink and drive, and I can't drink and play golf. So that means I don't get to drink much. Because <laughs> I'm always driving, I'm always playing, <laughs> okay? I took the beer can, and I threw the beer can, and that beer can symbolized I threw all of my sin, I threw all of my grief, I threw all my fear, and the Lord caught it and took it from me. Behold, I became a new creature in Christ Jesus. That very moment of a twinkling of an eye, he transferred all of my unrighteousness, all my sin, all my fear, all my doubt, all my insecurity, all my lack, not only my past, but my present and even my future. Because that same lamb today is still with me, transferring to me who he is, and he took all that I was, this Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But the good news about Passover is just not a matter of taking away, but it's really all about giving. Because all that he takes away from us is pales in comparison to all that he wants to give us. Amen. Wow. So he transfers to us all of his victory. The old song I played to Ben the other day at home. He never had heard it. He said, you know, Papa, that song makes me happy. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. I can't say it if I don't sing it, but I'm going to spare you the pain. Amen. All his victory comes back to us. It says in Isaiah 53, the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He becomes our substitution. This little lamb that we brought into that little hut, how did we know that, that, that in the context of that one meal offering of that lamb, that everything that we ever desired could be ours, and then some. Call upon me, saith the Lord, call upon me, and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not of. So get ready. Get your belt on. Put your shoes on and get your staff in your hand because God is ready to do something new in you when you take the lamb of God. Amen? So when I identify, because in the Passover, there's this beautiful thing of identification. Now, we're teaching a lot about identification today in the body of Christ, and to be honest with you, a lot of it is, is not identification, it's destruction, because it teaches you to find your identity within yourself, and there is no such thing that's righteous. Your identity is always in Him. Amen? doesn't make any difference who you are. It's all about who he is. Yeah, but I have so much to bring to the table. Yeah, you probably do. But how's that been working for you? 
<laughs> but when you're in Christ, you identify with him and you're so one with him that there's no separation between you and him. Amen? And that, that's what happens in the Passover. That when I identify with Christ, that means that his experiences, his things become my experiences. As long as I view myself as an individual, I will always have to face the battle in part by myself. I will always have to face the next challenge woefully inadequate because the challenge, I feel like somehow I should be able to do this. Remember, Paul said, I, I could do all things. Period. Paul said, I can do all things. No, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I love Galatians 2.20, you're very familiar. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, I've now become a victor because of this one reason. Christ is a victor. I've overcome the devil for one reason, because he crushed him underneath his feet. They said that in that day, how he, Satan is crushed under the feet of the people of God. Amen? I have no fear in my life because there's no fear within him. I've identified with his heart. I've become so one with him. I no longer have to strive and push and moan and groan and pant down in order to merit favor. Because now that blessing of that favor has been given to me because of who he is. I've identified with him. My identity is never found within myself. My identity is always found within him and is always expressed to you. Because identity, even if you find an identity in Christ, it's not just for you to be something you rejoice over just as a person, but it's what God has given to you as a people. Because, see, this is a nation that God is birthing. It's not birthing you. He's birthing us. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to take the Doe, the Doe family and the, the Jones family and that family from Egypt and the rest of the families can go to stay there and die. No, he said, I want every man, every woman, every child delivered together because we're the new nation of the Lord. Amen. You need one another more than you know, right? Your very life existence is dependent upon your need for him and for one another. Because that's, right. that's truly how you express who he is through you. So once we truly identify with the Lord, we put an end to the struggles, to many of the struggles and many of the battles that we go through. Amen. When we identify with Jesus, the mighty conqueror, then now we can say we're more than conquerors through him. When we identify with Christ, we become an heir of God, a joint heir with him. When we identify with Christ, we suffer with him, but we also reign with him. When we identify with Christ, we're also crucified with him, but now we, guess what? We also live with him. Amen? When we identify with his mercy and love, now we can have mercy and love as he does. See, when I, when I identify with Christ, then I begin to view you differently. I don't view you as a competitor or as a threat. I begin to view you through his eyes. Now I can love you the way he loves you. Wouldn't you like to be loved the way he loves? Wow. Would you like to be able to take down the guard that's so afraid to open up to people because you know that Sometimes their motives aren't pure towards you. Oh, I love God. I can just open up to him. But man, when I get around the people, I better put some walls up. See, the Lord wants this to be a kingdom without walls. 
so there can be a pure expression of identity, the identity to us and the identity through us that becomes an inclusive people that have one purpose, one vision, one goal, and that's to get into the land that's flowing with milk and honey together. Amen? It's through that identity that we go and we march through the wilderness and we endure the days of heat. We endure the time of struggle. We endure the time of frustration. And finally, we get to cross the river. Now we get to go into a whole new set of challenges that give a whole greater realm of victory than what we've ever known. Sure, it was great to be in the wilderness, to be provided for, but now we're going to go into Canaan. Now we're going to conquer the 32 nations. Now we're going to plant and we're going to yield. We're going to get the yield of the harvest. Now we're going to begin to rule and reign with him in that place. Hallelujah. So we come into this place of appropriation also where we come to the table of the Lord. And see, when you come to the table as a child, and the mother has prepared all, or the father in these days, prepared all the food before us. You don't say, oh, Mama, could I please, please have another piece of bread? No. When the table is spread, you just reach your hand out and grab it. Oh, please, Jesus, could you heal me? No, by his stripes we are healed. We just reach up and grab it. Jesus, could you just help me, help me, please? No, just take the help. Take it. He's a, it's already given to you. He's appropriated for you because every blessing from heaven has been given to you. It's been sent down express mail to you. He said, open the package. It's yours. Don't just look at it and, be, and, and but tear it open. Get after it. That's your present. It's all yours. Hallelujah. Woo, he's given all things to us that pertain to life and godliness. Taste and see, my brethren, that the Lord is good. Mm. Everybody lick your lips. Mm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. There's a never-ending abundance to God's provision. Reach into it. And how did you do it? You just one day... Heard a word, said, eat the lamb. <laughs> you didn't know that when you ate the lamb, it was going to open up a smorgasbord. You were going to be invited to the greatest buffet line that ever lived. How many know what buffets are? <laughs> I love, it's kind of a love-hate. Because I usually walk away with indigestion. But boy, howdy. Whew. I went to Korea. They have the most wonderful buffets. Daniel, buffets in Korea are so wonderful. I mean, they say, we're going to take you to the buffet. And I go, yuck. But they took me to a Korean buffet. And I said, mmm. I mean, it was incredible, except for the octopus. But it, <laughs> it was the most wonderful buffet. And it reminded me of the Lord. He said, here, I've set before you a table. Are you hungry this morning? Yeah. I've set before you a table. Come to the table of the Lord. Come and dine. Come and feast. Eat and eat all of it because God has an abundance for you. God has a victory for you. God has a triumphant song for you. Hallelujah. This our triumphant song. Father, thy son shall come forth in this hour to partake of who you are. Glory to God. Woo, preach it. Woo. Are you ready for something new? Are you ready for something new? Get ready, get ready, get ready. Something new is about to happen. See, prepare yourself for change. I know the morning, the day that I drove off to college, as an 18-year-old to drive to West Texas State University. I'm driving in my car, getting in the driveway, and my mother and dad are there. I couldn't tell what my dad was thinking. He was expressionless, no expression. But my mother was very obvious, crying. So I'm driving. 
pulled out of the driveway and I drive to turn left to go down the block. So I'm driving real slow and I'm waving, you know, smiling, waving. I get out of their sight. They go, ah, hallelujah, I'm free. <laughs> hallelujah. I didn't say hallelujah, it was something else. I'm free. <laughs> free indeed. I'm free at last. <laughs> and my poor mom's back there crying, <laughs> you know. <sighs> Because I was ready for something brand new to happen. Now, I, I can't tell you I learned much in college. Remember, this was in the 60s. If you learned anything in college in the 60s, it was a miracle from God. <laughs> but I want to tell you one thing, just by going, just by yielding just a little bit, didn't yield much, but a little bit, opened the door. Because all of a sudden, just making that change. Because see, I could have stayed in Muleshoe. I could have fulfilled my lifelong dream of becoming a taxidermist. <laughs> At the time, I didn't realize there wasn't anything to taxidermy around there. <laughs> Except uh, horned toads and uh, uh, rattlesnakes. And, and now they got pheasants up there, but they didn't have them back then. And, you know, if you've ever tried to taxidermy a quail, there ain't much there. You know, <laughs> I did buy a, 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 what was that, parakeet from a woman down the street, and that didn't work too good. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Freedom. Freedom, indeed. Woo, get ready for something new. Get in your car. Start the engine. Let's go. Let's get out of mule shoe. Let's get out of Egypt. We can stay there and die. We can stay here and die. You want to stay here and die? You know why I've always been so radical? Because I have a revelation of this. Oh, how many more people we could have. If I just kid, did quick insisting that we get out of Egypt, because we want to, oh, let's go back to Egypt. We're, this, being out here trusting God is so hard. They don't remember what it was like in Egypt under the taskmaster's whip, break, making brick without straw, living on rations, living under oppression, bondage. They don't remember that. See, oh, I just wished I could get back to my hometown. Just be like it. Just, I remember my childhood and how wonderful it was. Was it really? No. God has something far more for you. Right. Amen. He's has something far more for us. Get ready for the new. Get ready for the new. Don't be happy where we're at. Don't be satisfied what we have. Because remember, we're not in the kingdom yet. We're kind of in the kingdom, but we're not fully manifested. Until we got fully manifested, this says that all creation mm, groaning and moaning until now, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Amen. Lord, put us in the holy squeezer and let it squeeze out the sons and daughters of God on the other side. Amen. Okay. We must take the initiative. We've got to put the lamb in our mouth, put the blood on our doors. We've got to stir up our stumps. I wrote this down. Stir up your stump. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you. Shifting your roots. Moving them to another place. Sometimes when we feel well established... Sometimes we must realize in order for the promises to be fulfilled, we must be willing to step out of the place that we're in. That's what faith is, isn't it? It's what happened with Abraham. said, Abraham, I'm going to take you to a place of fulfillment. Say, what? Where are we going? I didn't tell you to ask where we're going. I'm just taking you there. Okay, let's go. So it said, Abraham obeyed God after he heard God, and he went 
on a journey with God, not even knowing where he was going. But because he was willing to obey God, God then brought him to a place that I'm Abraham, because of your obedience, I'm going to make you a father. Of... Now I know how to get an offering. I'm going, to, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. So Abraham left Earl of Chaldees. I'm sure he had family cemetery there, family roots there, some reputation there, some prestige there, some wealth there, but he walked out of the land not knowing where he was going because he knew there was a God that he had to have. So Jesus himself came outside the camp in order to bring forth his kingdom. Amen. Amen. We have to live on the cutting edge of the radicalness of our heart that says we will not be satisfied where we're at. We will not take our ease in Zion. We will not accept that this is all there is. There's got to be something greater that God has for us than what he has right here, right now. I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Paul even said it, I have not yet obtained, I have not yet reached him, but I'm pressing in with all my heart to the measure of the stature of the fullness which is in Christ Jesus. All this lamb must be my portion. Amen? I'm not saying be frustrated, I'm just saying be agitated. <laughs> Be willing to step out of the old into the new. Prepare yourself for a brand new residence. See, sometimes in order to move into a new place, we have to clean house where we've been living. How many know that? I mean, if you're a, one of these people that are called the hoarders, where you walk in your front door and you have a little tunnel. I watched a few of those shows one time and I got... I got so upset I couldn't watch anymore. I wanted to go whip those people. What's wrong with you? <laughs> they, walk, they walk through a tunnel to get in the house, and they can't even use their own bathroom because there's so, many, so much junk that they can't get to the commode. They can't even use their own kitchen because there's so much junk they can't use their stove or the refrigerator. They have to go to the neighbors. Wow. So if you told that person, hey, I'm going to move you into a brand new house. <laughs> ah! <laughs> and how many have ever had a move in your life? What's one of the first things you do? You sweep out. You know what it says in, 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 in Exodus? You take out the malice and the wickedness. <laughs> the malice and the wickedness come out of our hearts. and We sweep it out the house because we're leaving this house for a brand new house. Amen. But you can't leave this house if it's piled with 40 tons of debris. So when you, get, when you, when you say, Lord, I'm cleaning this house, what you're telling the Lord is, now I'm ready for the new house. It's not just God doing something for you right now. When you say, God, I repent, Lord, I cleanse me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, take away all the bitterness and the wrath and the strife and the wickedness and the malice, take all that stuff out of my spirit, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew the steadfast spirit within me. Guess what? It's not doing it just for this place right here, but it's God's saying, because you're doing that, I'm going to bring you to a brand new place. Get ready for the new residence. Hallelujah. Clean the house. And I know this, that we haven't moved in many houses in the last 29 years, but every, the last two times we've moved, the first thing to tell me, please, let's don't move that old furniture into this new house. Isn't it enough that I bought you a new house, now you want new furniture? <laughs> Hello. Right? But women know best because that old couch that you love so much that you chilled in for so long that it's leaning to one side because you leaned too much to one side and you were overweight and that one that couch that leans like that that you feel like it's the most comfortable chair that you have ever sat in in your life that old Klaus how, that old couch doesn't belong in this new house amen the Lord said I'm going to do a brand new thing 
in the midst of you. Shall it not spring forth to birth? Hallelujah. Shall it not be revealed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye? I'm going to bring a new place, a new residence that comes down from heaven and descends upon you. Hallelujah. How many are ready for the new house? Because you not only get the new house, you get new furniture. And you get the new car smell. Hallelujah. Enjoy it while you can. But every time that smell gets a little old, God's what God says, hey, you don't have to remodel. I'm just going to give you a new dwelling place. <laughs> so you go from new house to new house to new house. You go from glory to glory to glory. Image to image to image. God begins to do that. And you lay aside every weight, every sin that holds us back. Hallelujah. Then the final thing I wrote down is, how do you say it? Via? 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 What's Via? Steve? I mean, Garcia? Via? Condias? Via! Condias! I know what it meant. I was just joking. Via! Condias! Everybody say it loud. Via! Condias! Translate that. Go with God. Amen? Woo! Go with God. Follow the fire. Follow the cloud. Follow his presence. It, we, we're just like those people that back whenever, can't give you the exact date, they, I think they would come to St. Louis, wouldn't they, from the east? And they would form wagon trains. And all these people would come out of this comfort. They were, most of them were from the east and it was well established. And believe me, whatever they had back there was looked to be so much better than what they were about to get. Because here, mama, let's sell our house. Let's get all of our money and let's go buy this wagon. And these oxen or these horses or whatever they used. And let's put all of our life savings in this one venture, we're going to get in this wagon train, and who the heck knows where we're going to wind up? We're going to wind up somewhere, and when we get there, it's going to be a brand new place, and it's going to be called our place. Amen? Via Candias. They became pioneers. And see, God's calling the church in this hour to be a pioneer church, that we're willing to give up everything to get in some rickety wagon and say, giddy up, horsey, and go to a land that we really don't know what it looks like. We don't know what it smells like, and we really don't know how many battles we're going to have to face to get there. We don't know how many hardships it's going to cause us to go through to get there, but we know this one thing, God is with us. Amen? And if God be with you, my brethren, who can be against you? We become the pilgrims or the pioneers of the kingdom. There has to be a people, and they're called the remnant of God, the people of God. There's a remnant people upon this earth right now that says we will not settle for anything less than the land of milk and honey, the breakthrough that you're looking to have out of a people upon the earth. We are those people that say, Vio Condias. See you later, alligator. We're on a journey to find him and the fullness of who he is. Amen? Can you believe all this? Can you accept it? Can you walk in it? Will you embrace it? Will you eat the lamb? Will you drink the wine? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to the Lord with me this morning. Thank you, Father. Lord, we receive this Passover season. We receive, Lord, this is a new season for all of us most exciting, most breathtaking time of our life is when we embrace you. When we, when we lay hold of who you are, the hem of the garment, and embrace this life that you've come to give us, this life abundantly, this fullness of life, this fullness of freedom that you've come to give the people of God, to bring us into a place where our only satisfaction, our only desire is to know you and to experience the power of your resurrection. 
So, Lord, we receive you this morning with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up with me today if you would. 